to begin. Uh, hello, everyone. I am so happy to see you all here for uh, this session of the Pari Center's online summer series called um, Exploring the Life and Work of David Bohm. I'm uh, James G. Barbieri. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Pari Center, and I will be your host for this session. Um, here today, we also have Eleanor Pete, who is the Program Director of the Pari Center. Um, so if you have any questions, you can just uh, write in the uh, chat section of the Zoom call. Um, now, before we begin, I would just like to remind everyone of a couple of Zoom rules for this session. Um, so first of all, during the presentation, we ask the participants to turn off their <coughs> microphone um, just to ensure better quality audio. Um, for this reason, we may mute you if uh, we hear background noise, uh, yeah, I mean, this is not to silence anyone. Uh, it's just to improve, you know, to have a good overall uh, audio quality. If you do want to ask a question um, or make a contribution or anything like that, there is a uh, raise your hand function here on Zoom. Um, if you can't find it, just physically raise your hand and if we spot you, we'll uh, give, you, uh, give you the opportunity to speak. Uh, we also invite everyone to turn on their video camera, um, as we believe it creates a nice, uh, inclusive educational environment. Um, now, all sessions will be recorded for archival purposes. Um, the recordings will not include, well, this ha first half an hour where we're just introducing ourselves, um, and it won't include the breakout rooms. Um, but it will basically only include the uh, speaker's presentation and the follow-up discussion and Q&A. Um, these recordings will be available to anyone who has purchased a ticket for the session, who is here, or has bought their ticket but couldn't make it here, so we, these uh, recordings will be available. Um, now, the, today's session will be divided in three parts. Uh, first, we will have a presentation. Uh, then we will be divided in smaller groups of more four or five for about 20 minutes uh, to discuss a question provided by our speaker, Olival. Um, and then we'll come back together in this main room where we will have the opportunity to discuss, make contributions, ask questions. Um, so yes, those are the rules. Uh, now I would like to introduce our speaker, Olival Freire. Uh, we are honored to have a physicist who has written a book about David Bohm. Um, Olival is a distinguished professor of physics and history of physics from Brazil. Um, in 2019, uh, he published Bohm's biography, David Bohm, A Life Dedicated to Understanding the Quantum World. Uh, in his presentation today, uh, Olival will throw light on David Bohm's stay in Brazil and will reflect on the early stage of Bohm's mature life, looking at elements of continuity that we um, may find in his whole life. Uh, we welcome now Professor Oliver Freire. Over to you, Oliver. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for being here. And thank you very much to the Paris Center for the invitation. I will try to share the screen because I have a few slides. Let me see if it, this works well. Yeah, I think it works. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as uh, James said, I am speaking today uh, of a stage in Bond's life, uh, which is less known by the why, why the audience who follows Bond's uh, life, uh, who follows the Bond and who follows. Uh, Bohm's ideas. So it's about the young Bohm, till the early 50s, when Bohm was about 35 years old. But I don't want to begin by uh, his uh, childhood. Uh, I want to, to take a point uh, when he arrived at Berkeley in the early 40s to continue uh, his graduate studies. I would say that then he had already consolidated two intellectual trends which would characterize his whole life. Uh, he knew what kind of physics he enjoyed to work on. And he was not only concerned with science. For him, since this time, science was part of a larger picture involving society as a whole. 
from uh, the point of view, uh, the, the, the point of view of physics at that time, he worked on plasma, and then on the subject he would dedicate his entire life, uh, the quest for understanding the quantum world. Thus, uh, I'm not speaking about the whole uh, scientific life of Bohm, because after that, for instance, in the end of the fifties, he, he and Yaki Haronov made a, a important breakthrough with the uh, Haronov Bohm effect. Uh, and in the sixties and the seventies, he, he worked in what we call wholeness and implicate order uh, approach or, or program. And uh, in the 80s, uh, he worked on, I would say, he came back to, to, to his early interpretation of quantum mechanics, but in a new manner, trying to make a sense uh, of what was the quantum potential uh, idea, which was uh, on the basis of his uh, early uh, ideas uh, on quantum mechanics. Now, uh, as I said, I don't want to begin from the beginning. It would be a little bit boring, and I was not able to uh, spot uh, something uh, about his childhood, uh, except things that uh, we know from David Pitt's uh, uh, biography. We know, for instance, that he was uh, fascinated by science in his uh, early teens, because he read the science fiction magazines, such as Amazing Stories, uh, which at that time he had became very popular in the United States. As you know, uh, stories of space travel were not new. You may remember Julius Verne's uh, works. But in the early 20s, this became a kind of fashion between uh, young, the young American audience. Then Bond was one of these young uh, students very interested in ideas related to uh, space travel. He was the eldest in his family. He was born in 1917 in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was from, uh, of, uh, somewhere in the Frida Bonn, uh, both uh, Jewish immigrants, immigrants from Hungary and Lithuania origin. Uh, and we know well, uh, you remember the film, uh, this is the picture of the second story, uh, second-hand furniture story, uh, with Samuel Bonn, uh, ran uh, through uh, his life. We also know that uh, Bond's family was not a, a, a very uh, friendly uh, space because Frida Bond suffered from mental instability since she arrived in the US because she had difficulty coping with the new language uh, and the environment. But I want to emphasize, and this is the first point, uh, that I think that we, in a certain moment, we, I, David Pitt, uh, Bezo Haile, and the others, uh, we were, in a certain sense, uh, uh, trapped in Bohm's own description of his youth uh, in a grim family. This was true, but I want to emphasize the role school played in Bohm's life. Maybe I am speaking about a very trivial thing because good schools is a very important thing for everybody. But I would say, as I am a Brazilian and the, in my country, we do not have such good school spread for everybody. I was very uh, sensitive when I found that school was a very important space in Bond's life. Now, you have here the picture of the old uh, memorial, uh, GAR uh, Memorial High School. And uh, it's over there, that I think, that he blossomed as a person uh, who could follow a science career. And also very important, uh, he developed good social skills. Uh, the most important evidence I have of these social skills is this picture that you also saw the movie. I was very impressed when I saw, so what is this? Uh, it, this is a very American tradition. When you finish high school, you have the graduation uh, book, uh, which is published and everybody uh, keeps this like a memory. I've never seen uh, Bohm's yearbook uh, until recently that uh, my, uh, my partner, Agnes, insisted with me that we should try to see Bomb's uh, yearbook. 
And then uh, we did not find it uh, on the internet, and then we just went to Luxembourg. And the, 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 the principal of the school just gave me, gave me a, a, a one example of this book. When I open on this uh, page, you see, Bohm was considered by his fellow colleagues and professors. His nickname was not Dave. It was Einstein. Which means, so 1935, Einstein was already well known in the United States, which means that his colleagues and the professors and teachers saw in him when he was finished, 17 years old, a, a guy who would be, <laughs> uh, I would not say a, a, a similar to Einstein, but this kind of career. And the second important thing, you see uh, his description. This description was not written by him, but by the colleagues. This is the tradition of the uh, yearbook in the United States. He was considered a deep sighted in intelligence, ideas, atoms, and influences. And the last thing, you see by the number of clubs uh, that he was a very, very good guy, cons considered by his colleagues a very good guy. Uh, and especially because he, he, he attended, he attended, he was part of the commencement announcement committee, which was kind of a prize because only the, 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 the people who the, were well considered uh, could, could have, considered among his colleagues, could have this uh, distinction, I would say. Now, if this is about the role of school, I would say that uh, on the other hand, the school nowadays is very fond of having bomb, uh, having had bomb as uh, his students. Uh, this second picture, I, I beg your pardon because the, 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 the picture is very bad. I was the photographer and it's not very clear, but it's the Bond's prize. So they created in 2004, uh, the David Bond Science Award for Excellence in Science and Mathematics. And they explained to me that it's not all year that they uh, choose one student to receive the prize. In some years, there is no brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, student to, to, to get the prize, then they jump the year. Uh, and the school was very... So I'm talking everything about this just to tell you and to tell Paul that uh, Wilkesboro uh, and the, the GAR Memorial High School deserves a, a, a very special presentation of this film over there, and I'm sure that they will be interested to, to do this. Now, let's jump again uh, to, to the other subject. I also found in this, uh, when he was teenager, the roots of these social concerns. Uh, because he lived in this uh, town, Wilkesbury. Uh, this was a, a coal mine uh, town, uh, which is part of the large uh, Appalachian anthracite coal region, uh, which was an extensive uh, and intensive coal mine town uh, region uh, since the mid 19th century. But as you may imagine, you wonder, uh, work conditions were very oppressive in the town and the widespread use of child labor uh, and the unfair subcontracting sub system uh, was part of the town. These pictures were part of a campaign in the United States to abolish the uh, child uh, working. Uh, you may find the full collection of this picture at the Library of Congress. Uh, so it was not, it was not a, an amateur who, who, who got this picture, and this is just one of the pictures we, we can find. Uh, and the, the campaign to abolish the child uh, uh, labor in the United States took the working conditions in this region as an example to convince Americans that uh, uh, child labor should be uh, abolished. But when Bond was in his teens, uh, the, 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 in the text, this region just collapsed for two reasons. First, coal was no longer the main uh, source of food uh, at that time. Uh, it was uh, very expensive and there were uh, another source of energy. 
in the, the Great uh, Series. And the second, the Great Depression. So it was the time of uh, the number of unemployed uh, workers grew uh, dramatically in the region. And at that time, there was no uh, unemployed benefits. Then you may imagine that the town was part of uh, social unrest. I found in a very interesting memoir book uh, of somebody who lived in this region, a meeting, a picture of the meeting of the unemployed in Wilkes-Barre, 1933. Uh, by the time Ibon was 15 years old. Uh, and this book, uh, which is a, a, a book, the, the author argues, and more than one author argues, that uh, this, uh, the, 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 the manifestations in this region played a role in something very important in the United States, uh, which is the, uh, the Social Security Act, which was passed uh, in the American Congress in 1935. So my conclusion is that no doubt Bohm was strongly influenced by this social context. And we know from his testimonies, uh, from his interviews and from David Pitt's book, that Bohm uh, was interested in uh, uh, politics at that time. I will just read a small piece of these uh, interviews. My main interest was really physics, as you see although I had a vivid interest in politics and the general state of civilization. This was 50 years later. Uh, but uh, we also know that as a teenager, Bohm was strongly uh, adept, so he strongly believed in the American dream as a consequence, as consequence uh, of individual achievements. And this idea of the American dream through individual achievements was taken by the Great Depression, uh, uh, which he lived, he lived uh, in Wilkes-Barre. We also know that he was interested in politics. We, we, we have in the book, uh, David Pitt's book, a very uh, nice story because uh, it's a very nice story because I'm speaking uh, to the Paris Center, uh, which is in Italy. And then Bon remembered that he was against Mussolini when Mussolini arrived to power, but his father thought Mussolini would assure order in Italy, which was order for his father. Mussolini would make Italian train run on time. It was, a, I would say, a naive expectation because still today we know that not always the Italian trains run on time. Then Bonn was very concerned with the political context in Europe, Europe particularly when the Nazi took power in Germany. But we also know from his interviews, it's a very important thing, that he uh, was a, a customer of this uh, public library. Over there, he read socialist newspapers such as The Nation and New Republic. Uh, I didn't know these magazines, and then when I was uh, writing the, 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 the biography, I went through these uh, magazines and still today they are published, not only each week, uh, one of them is on a month uh, basis. Um, but it was, I would say, it was at this library that Bohm uh, developed his first ideas of social concern. On the other hand, we do not have any evidence that Bohm was engaged in political activities when he went to the undergraduate studies uh, in the Pennsylvania College. We only have evidences of political uh, uh, commitment when he arrived uh, at Berkeley. But before arriving to Berkeley, uh, I needed to talk a little bit about the, his time at Caltech because he, he, was, he went first to Caltech. As you know, Caltech was and still is one of the best universities uh, in the world. But Bond did not like Caltech. Why he did not like Caltech? Uh, I would say because he had experience which were formative for him about what kind of science he would uh, like to follow. And particularly, I, would, I, I wanted to speak about the idea of scientific style. So uh, 
One of the important experience he had at Caltech, it was the courses of uh, electromagnetism. The teacher was uh, uh, William Ralph Smith. Uh, it was based on a book which was a kind of a bestseller, a Static and Dynamic Electricity. But Bon soon became unsatisfied with this course. I checked the book, I tried to see uh, reports on the course, and the, 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 the answer is clear course. This course was based on Smith's uh, 12 years of experience teaching, uh, and the, uh, this book followed the tradition of a detailed presentation of the mathematical methods to deal with problems uh, in electrostatic and electrodynamic. Only in the end of the book, the book introduced the full, the full theory of electromagnetism, the micro equation. However, what's the problem? Uh, everybody who followed the course uh, 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 of electromagnetism knows that one of the most beautiful theoretical results in physics is when the compact form of the Maxwell equations allow the students, allow the students to make the prediction of the existence of the electromagnetic waves. This life-changing experience Bohm only had in the end of the course, and he did not, he did not like the course. Uh, we have another story from the same time. Uh, because uh, he was very attracted at the time by a book, uh, the 1936 book by uh, uh, Eddington, Relativity Theory of Protons and Electrons. This was uh, a kind of a precursor of the current quest for a theory of everything. Uh, but it was a very speculative book. Uh, I have a, a, a testimony of a historian of physics, Helia Craig, uh, who said that uh, Eddington's book was as remarkable ambitious as it was remarkable and successful. And I would say that Bond had the double experience because he tried to understand the book. He did not uh, uh, get uh, the, uh, an understanding of the book because of the mathematical technicalities, but he tried to write a summary in English uh, of this book. And he went uh, with this summary to present this to a very well-known Caltech professor, Richard C. Thoma. And the professor Thoma just said, go, 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 this uh, has no value, and the bomb became uh, deeply frustrated. There is a third evidence uh, about problems at Caltech. Uh, in Caltech, uh, there is a tradition that in the first year of graduate studies in physics, you have no research problem to solve, and you have no supervisor. You just follow course, and you learn the mathematical techniques, and so on. Then Bohm was frustrated, frustrated, and he considered uh, during the transition from the first to the second year, uh, he considered to uh, give up. At that time, there was a, a happy coincidence in Bond's life because he met, at Caltech, he met uh, Julius Oppenheim, who was a professor at Berkeley, but he commuted uh, once a week to give a course uh, at Caltech. It was kind of a... Uh, 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 first, uh, 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 an immediate uh, love among them, because uh, uh, Oppenheim offered an assistantship at Berkeley, uh, and in two or three weeks, Bohm was at Berkeley uh, to work with Oppenheim. Over there, uh, uh, he, he began immediately to work on a, a physics problem. But, let me tell you that there is one thing that I think Bohm did not realize during his times at Caltech in the Berkeley. Uh, this, this is the existence of a diverse style in physics, difference which reflect deep entrenchment in the practice of this science throughout history. I know that you may wonder how the concept of style, so common in art, literature, and humanities, may be related to science. But indeed, historians and philosophers of science have suggested that when one considers a science, uh, not only 
it's consolidated the results, but also the work implied in their production. Uh, the physicists or the scientists need to make choices in their reasoning. And this choice may be ruled by certain personal choice, which may also be shared by a group of scientists, thus creating what we can call a school or a tradition or a style. Uh, we have in the history of physics in the 20th century uh, a very nice uh, case of two contrasting styles. Uh, I cite in, in, in the biography uh, works by Schumann Sert, who was a biography of Sommerfeld, and also Michel Paty uh, works uh, about style. And the, uh, the comparison is between Sommerfeld, Arnold Sommerfeld, a German physicist, very influential in his time, with a wonderful a scientific achievements. A number of his students went to, 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 to get Nobel Prize. Sommerfeld did not win a Nobel Prize, but if you check, uh, what was one of the physicists in the 20th century who would deserve the Nobel Prize? Everybody would say, every physicist would say Sommerfeld. But Sommerfeld's style was to solve problems. Then this style we call physics, uh, uh, Schumacher uh, 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 calls physics of problems. And you have a second kind of style, which was followed by Einstein, by Planck, and in a certain extent by Niels Bohr, which is a physics which is based on principle, on axioms, on ideas from, basic ideas from these ideas, these axioms, you derive a number of results. In both styles, you use mathematics, but you see in the second style, there is a huge room for ideas, for pictures. And no doubt, these two styles, uh, they followed the history of physics in the 20th century. It's true that in the United States, the first style, the physics of the problem, was uh, more adopted than the other. But Oppenheim, for instance, it was a typical student in the second tradition. And Bohm shaped his own style, I would say, in a kind of a combination of these two styles, but more inclined to the second style. Bohm did not like very much the axiomatization uh, of physics. We can discuss this if it is the case. But he always liked to have analogies or metaphor, but made analogy, pictures. And from these pictures, he would be able to treat these pictures through the mathematical technicalities. Uh, before we continue, I want to say that... Oh, right. was... Okay. Bon was good, very skilled uh, in mathematics. So, uh, it was not that he had uh, any difficulty with mathematics. It was just a kind of style, uh, and you have different styles. Now let me speak a little bit about his arrival in, at Berkeley uh, from the point of view of his political engagement. As you know, a bond engagement with the Communist Party happening at the confluence of two different contexts. The first one, the World War II, and the second one, the social and political atmosphere uh, he found at Berkeley. Uh, the first one, the social uh, and political uh, world context, you know well. Uh, in December 1941, uh, the Japanese attack on the US military base in Pearl Harbor led the United States to declare war on Japan uh, and enter the Second World War. Uh, then, uh, in the early 1942, you should remember that the US, the UK, and the Soviet Union were now on the same side on the battlefield. And it was these allies, which included a number of different circles of activists in the world, uh, which was responsible, responsible for the creation of this huge alliance who, uh, which led to the defeat uh, of Nazi. This very special uh, situation was described by a, a former colleague of Bond at Birkbeck, the distinguished historian Eric Hobsbawm. He created the bizarre expression, I would cite, international ideological civil war against fascism. 
to describe the context of the time. Why I bring this? First, because you may understand that it is a civil war, it cannot be uh, international. So if it is an international, it is not civil war. So what Hobsbawm was saying for us was the national loyalists at the time were tempered by the great alliance against the Nazi. This was the reason because in Italy, in France, for instance, you have Italians and French who resisted their own governments trying to defeat their own uh, governments. I put this because all the story be related to uh, atomic uh, espionage, we speak uh, about this, uh, needs to be seen in this context. Out of this context, it's, it's just a story for uh, Hollywood movies uh, and espionage, espionage and etc. But uh, the second reason uh, uh, of Bond uh, joining the Communist Party, it was because he felt at home with Hoppenheim, his students and his friends. Uh, most of these students were very related to the uh, challenge of creating a, a union uh, chapter of the, the technical and scientific workers at Berkeley. And uh, some of them became very close uh, to Bonn. Uh, I'm speaking of Bernard Peters, Joseph, Joseph Weinberg, Lomanitz, and Frank Oppenheimer, who was the brother of Julius uh, Oppenheimer. And I, Bonn was also very familiar, very uh, close to the physicist Philip, Mor Philip Morrison and Melba Phillips. It was not by chance that you had a huge correspondence among them. Uh, later uh, in the 50s. He also met uh, that girl who was uh, his first girlfriend, Beth Frieda, uh, very well known later by his feminist uh, activists. Now, Bonn felt the consequences of this connection with the Communist Party uh, since the beginning, because uh, as you know, uh, the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory became a very important piece in the Manhattan Project. Uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that this was, this radiate, uh, this accelerator created by uh, Ernst Lawrence was the largest accelerator at the time, and it was considered the the best candidate to the great challenge of the Manhattan Project, of any atomic project, which is how to get uranium enriched with a certain isotope. Uh, natural uranium came in a mixture uh, of isotopes which are not fissile. You need to have a number uh, of isotopes, and the, as you may know, isotopes may not be uh, separated by chemical methods. You need uh, different methods, and the electromagnetic method was the good candidate. Uh, the the Berkeley accelerator uh, was changed to this objective. Uh, he, it received a different name, Caltron, and the huge industrial plant the United States built in the end of the war, 1944, uh, in Tennessee, to produce uranium and NOF uh, to the bombs was based in this method, which was developed at Berkeley. So that's the reason bomb was in the forefront at the Manhattan Project. But he was not accepted to work at the Manhattan Project, and it, this is, a, at the time, the explanation was because he had relatives in, in, in Europe, but it, it was not the, the true reason. The reason we know that now is that the American intelligence was following all these guys at Berkeley who were linked to the Communist Party, who were linked to the Union activities, and they, the American intelligence, uh, the General Leslie Groves, who, who was uh, the scientist, the, 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 the main manager of the, uh, the, the project, uh, he did not uh, trust in these guys. This is a very complex situation because he trusted in Oppenheim. He invited Oppenheim with all his leftist background to be the scientific director 
uh, of the Manhattan Project. Uh, if I went to talk about the Manhattan Project, this would be another conversation. I just want to, to, to give you an idea uh, of the complexity of the situation. Now, Bonn was not accepted to go to, 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 to work on the Manhattan Project, uh, but indeed he was mobilized to work on the Manhattan Project in the sense that in a certain moment, all physicists working on the Manhattan Project, they were uh, a group in a, in a, a small region outside uh, of San Francisco, outside uh, of Berkeley, but some works were done in the universities, at Berkeley, Chicago, uh, and the others. Then, I now left aside the idea uh, of uh, Bohm's Marxism to come back to Bohm's uh, scientific activities. But I wanted to say, and I love it that Bezo Heile is here, that I never bought the idea that Bonn had only nine months in the Communist Party, Bezo. Uh, as a historian, sorry, <laughs> but uh, from the full correspondence I could examine, uh, Bonn, even when he was in the exile, even when he was in Brazil and Israel, he was still linked to the communists, not organically, not frequenting, frequenting meetings. But if you see the Chris Talbot book with the full correspondence of the 50s, it's clear that he broke with Marxism. He, he was no longer a communist in 1956 and 57, when the Soviet Union invaded him. Uh, by the way, uh, it's going to appear book, Bezo Haile knows this, uh, uh, an Israeli scholars, they found the notes of a book on dialectic, materialism dialectic, given by Bonn in Israel in 1955 and 56. And this book is going to be published. Uh, I know that Bezo Haile knows this history because uh, they asked me who is the responsible uh, for the, the bombs copyright. And then I said, it's Bezo Haile. So his relation with Marxism, his relationship with communism uh, extended from 1942 to 1956 or 57. So it was 14, 15 years. Uh, I say this because if you want, if you we want to understand uh, bombs uh, uh, mind, we need to take into account this kind of deep engagement uh, he had with Marxist ideas. Now come back to the his scientific training. He received uh, after his doctoral degree. Uh, he was hired by the radiation laboratory to work uh, on this equipment, this new cyclotron accelerator, uh, which is the caloton. What was the problem? The problem is that you needed to have metallic uranium in the gaseous form. Then you need to have uranium in high temperature. Uranium is a metal to give a gas uh, of <laughs> metals. You need to have a huge temperature. Uh, matter in this huge temperature, it's the state of matter we call plasma, uh, different from the three traditional states of matter, liquid, solid, uh, and the gas. So uh, plasma is not a gas. Uh, it, it is related to gas, but it is different because uh, all the atoms are ionized. They, 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 they had, uh, a different charge, they are not neutral. So the big problem was to focus uh, this gas uh, with magnetic uh, fields. Then Bond worked on this, and the, at the beginning he was with two other guys. These two guys left uh, to, 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 to join the Manhattan Project uh, uh, outside Berkeley, but then a team, uh, of British physicists came to work with precisely this team. This was a very distinguished team because it was Massey, a wonderful physicist, Burhope, uh, a 
great physicist, Mark Oliphant, who was the leader of the team, uh, and the, uh, he was an expert in accelerators, and a young physicist that probably been highly met as many times in his life, Maurice Wilkins. Uh, the, three, the first three guys were uh, 10 years uh, older than Bon, but Maurice Wilkins was the same age of Bon. I'm speaking about Maurice Wilkins because Bon would maintain close connection with this team, especially with Wilkins, throughout his life. And Wilkins would become later, uh, he would uh, leave physics to molecular biology, and he, he would become the third man in the trio who awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the structure of DNA. And Wilkins shared with Bon a deep interest in philosophy. But only the, the, the importance uh, of the work uh, of Bon with plasma, uh, we can have an idea only due to the declassification of these war studies. At the time, they were classified. Nobody could uh, see. Even Bon could not follow uh, these works because he had not, he was not authorized. So he worked, he, he gave the, the results, but he was not part of the Manhattan Project. Then in 19, uh, so this is Josh Oppenheim and, uh, uh, and the, uh, Lawrence. In 1949, the United States began to publish uh, documents from the Manhattan Project, uh, which were no longer considered sensitive. Uh, they were not the roadmap to the bomb. Uh, this is the collection of these books which were published. And in one of these books, uh, the characteristic of electrical discharge in magnetic field over there, uh, organized by Guthrie and Wackerlin, we have two very important things to identify bomb, to, 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 to evaluate bomb's work. First, five out of the 11 papers in this book were authored or co-authored by David Bond. So he was no one more in the team. One can say that he was the main driving force uh, in this team. And the second, it's on this book that you, you will find the expression of Bon diffusion. So Bon had an idea, and you see here his style being uh, uh, working. Uh, the, the plasma at that time was uh, considered uh, the, the ions uh, suffering uh, random movements from collisions, etc. But Bohm imagined that in addition to these chaotic movements, there would be a second movement, that all the ions charged, they could move in a certain direction, then create a field, and this field would dump the full movement of the ions. So the real movement, you had this combination of these collective movements and individual movements. And from this, he was able to calculate what we call now bond diffusion, which is a result which indicates that uh, it's difficult to confine a plasma uh, due to this second movement. Uh, I would say that Bond's model had uh, far-reaching uh, uh, implications. Uh, because after the war, uh, physicists tried to use plasma to have a fusion uh, reactor to, to, to have uh, nuclear energy uh, on a cheap way. Uh, and the, during almost 20 years, physicists worked uh, uh, trying to overcome, to circumvent uh, the role of bond diffusion. Only with the design of what we call tokamak in the mid 60s is that a second, uh, so it was a, a, a different kind, second not, sorry, a different kind of design uh, of a, 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 a plasma ma machine. Uh, this was able to, uh, the physicists were able to overcome this, but overcoming not in the sense that bond diffusion was wrong is that nowadays when you are thinking about a tokamak 
you need to consider in your calculations the role of bond diffusion. Uh, that's the reason that if you check in the Web of Science, these databases, uh, you will not find a paper by bond with the name bond diffusion, because they, as you see, this was published in a, in a book, and the books uh, do not appear in the Web of Science. But I found till 2018 about more than 300 titles, titles of papers with the name bomb diffusion. That's the reason uh, why uh, this role was very influential. Uh, now, uh, let, me, let me cite a, trans, a short transcription of how bomb again worked on this. So, he had this, this analogy, this picture of uh, collective movements, but uh, from his own citations, we can see, I'm citing. The plasma became very interesting to me. I could see that this was a kind of analogy to the problem of the individual and the society. You had in plasma what I call the collective behavior, that is oscillations. Every plasma can oscillate. When all the electrons move together, they produce an electric field that draws them back so they will oscillate. They oscillate in a coherent way which belongs to the whole. I call it a collective movement. Stillborn speaking in, in his uh, recollection. How was this collective movement maintained in despite of the random basis of the electrons? You see, this was the kind of interesting social question. It was rather like society, everybody moving in his own way and you have certain social collective tendencies still exist. We have now a very nice paper by Alexei Kozhevnikov, which is fully dedicated to this kind of analogy in bond uh, thought. And you see, an analogy between a social problem, a physics problem, and then after he developed the analogy, he went to make the calculations and do the calculations. Now, after the war, Bohm was considered a very promising young physicist uh, in the American physics. You needed to take into account that after the World War II, America was the paradise for physicists in the world. Europe was destroyed. Uh, UK was no strong enough to attract uh, physicists. Uh, the Soviet Union, it was another story. So it was the paradise of physicists, and the bomb was considered by then one of the most promising, uh, promising experiments. We have two evidences uh, of this. First, he was hired by Princeton. As you know, uh, he was suggested by the physics department at the Princeton University by uh, John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, Wheeler went to California, interviewed him, and he became a teacher uh, at Princeton, one of the most prestigious universities uh, at the time, still today. But there is a second evidence of the role of Bohm. Still, at Princeton, he had two students, two graduate students, Eugene Gross and David Pines. Uh, <clears throat> with Pines, he extended the approach uh, they had applied for plasma. They extended this approach to the study of metals, uh, like uh, modeling metals, modeling, modeling metals as a dense gas. And this approach in the literature nowadays we call random phase approximation. Uh, Bond did not follow later this work, but Pines extended this, uh, this uh, work uh, for a number of different subjects. Super superconducting metal with John Bardeen, uh, nuclear spectra, uh, and with Ogbo and Ben Mottelson, uh, they had a nice interaction uh, around this. And it's an inter interaction you can see in Ben Mottelson, who was an American physicist who went to, to live, he is still alive in uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen, and he won the Nobel Prize with uh, Ogbo and the uh, third person about, with a nuclear model. 
And Ben Motos acknowledged the influence of this approach in his Nobel Prize speech in 1975. So this is one of the evidence uh, of the importance of Bohm's work, but we have another evidence. It's a picture which is in the film, but I want to say two or three words about this picture. After the war, the American had the idea of bringing together the best and promising young theoretical physicists together without the old European theoretical physicists, just a few ones, just to create an ambience to say to these guys, this is the agenda of physics after the war, and you are going to be the leader of the new agenda. Over there, you, at this picture, you will find uh, not, not less than uh, Beth, uh, who was not an American, but who was based on, on America, he is uh, here. Uh, you will find uh, Feynman, a uh, young guy. Uh, you, here is uh, Wheeler, who, who was not so, uh, so old uh, at, at the time. Uh, and you, and over there, you will find David Bohm. So this is an evidence uh, about Bohm was considered uh, at the time. So I have just a few minutes to conclude my initial talk. I want to now to say that just when research into plasma and the metals and the writing of the textbook Quantum Theory, which was when Bohm published this book, this book was very well received. And then at that time, in 1949, his career collapsed in the America uh, due to the uh, political climate created by the Cold War turmoil that took hold in the US. He was called to a committee of the American Congress. You know the, the story. And they asked Bon if he was a communist. But if you take the, uh, I come back, if you take uh, the, the, the correspondence at the time, the problem, the, the question was if he was a communist, but he was, the, the, the committee was looking for a certain scientist X, particularly the person who had handed the atomic secrets to the Soviets. Now, to cut short a long story, uh, in two years, Bond's life dramatically changed. Uh, you know from the film, he, he cited the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the Congress uh, accused him of contempt to the, the Congress. He was condemned. He was uh, to prison. Uh, and the Princeton University suspended him from uh, teaching Dutch and suspending him from entering the campus and uh, visiting the libraries. And he was uh, uh, acquitted from the charges by federal judge but Prince Todi did not change uh, his position and then he was without, uh, 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 without employment. Before going to the end of my uh, initial uh, presentation, I want to say a very important thing. Uh, because uh, we are now 70 years, uh, 75 years after these episodes. So what can we conclude about these episodes uh, 70 years later in hindsight? So the first conclusion is uh, clear. Uh, Bohm was a victim uh, of McCarthyism. But I wanted to have a second answer. I wanted to see if there was a minimum, minimal evidence of Bohm being a spy. That's why I cited Hobsbawm. If Bohm were a spy, for me it would not be a problem because I can understand what was the context of the Second World War. And you had in the UK, for instance, uh, people like great physicists like Bruno Pontecorvo, Fuchs, uh, who, who did uh, spionage uh, because they considered that uh, even the great news war in the end of the war, he tried to convince Roosevelt and the, 
and, and uh, Churchill that they should share the atomic secrets with the Russians. But what conclusion I arrived? Uh, first, the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory had its activity scrutinized for years. So 70 years later, it's easy to see the literature. So I just did my job. I went to the libraries to review the uh, literature. So I can say you that I checked all the I checked all the relevant literature concerning leakages from the Manhattan Project, including information stored in the Soviet archives, which were open in the 1990s, and the, the Vinona transcripts. This Vinona is a project which now is public. Uh, this was the American project to gather and decode messages from Soviet agents based in the US to the Soviet Union. So far, this huge literature has found no evidence of a bomb's engagement in espionage. espionage. More recently, Adam Becker uh, got to a, a, a FOIA request uh, an access to bomb FBI file. It's a 500 pages. I read everything, and I can tell you that the FBI did not found, find any hint uh, about espionage. More about this. Uh, recently, uh, some documents uh, about Morris Wilkins, the colleague of a bomb, uh, came out. And we know that now, now that the British uh, MI5 surveyed Maurice Wilkins following a suggestion of the FBI uh, during eight years till 1953, when the MI5 dropped the case due to the lack of evidence. So my conclusion, Spionage, which indeed existed uh, at the time, I'm not naive about this, happened. But as far as we know elsewhere, Bond was not part of the ring of Spionage. Now, he left the US because he became a victim of Marcatism. He lost his position in Princeton. Then he went to Sao Paulo. I want just to say that he, why Brazil, why Sao Paulo? Because there were good Brazilian physicists at Princeton at that time. Uh, over there, this guy, it's clear that he's not Brazilian, he is a Japanese. Uh, this is Yukawa. On the left, uh, this is Cesar Latz, who discovered with Cecil Paulo uh, the Meson Pi. Uh, and the four guys were Brazilian physicists. And these two guys, Jaime Tiomino and Leite Lopes, were responsible for bringing bomb to Brazil. This is the uh, modest headquarters of the physics department at the time, uh, 1951. And we have here the letter from Brown to Jaime Tiomino, uh, just by a small anecdote. Uh, Jaime Tiomno was doing his doctoral uh, dissertation at Princeton under Wheeler. And at that time, Wheeler, when the, 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 the work was over, uh, Wheeler left the, 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 the United States to, to, a, a, a project, to, to a stay in Europe. Then the committee uh, which evaluated the uh, Tiomno uh, works was presided, was, uh, the head was born. Then uh, he wrote this uh, to Jane. As you may know, I have not been reappointed to Princeton because of the trouble with the American committee. I am therefore interested in another job, either temporary or permanent. It is very hard to me to get a job in the US because the history and the fear. Do you know if, if anything is available uh, in Brazil? Now, let's jump to the, really, the end of my, I want to put this equation, but I am not going to talk anything about this equation because tomorrow you will have a nicer view of these equations through the talk of Chris Jordan. Uh, but let me uh, tell you my final words. Uh, when in Sao Paulo, as you know, the American consulate confiscated the bond passport, it told him they would hand it back only in the case bond returned to the US. 
which Bond was afraid of. Um, but he wanted to travel, and the only solution he found was to apply for a Brazilian citizenship in order to have passport. When he applied for Brazilian citizenship, the United States withdrew his American citizenship. It was necessary 30 years for Bond getting back his American citizenship, only 1986. Now, a final word is about the, his work on hidden variables interpretation. Uh, this new interpretation he presented, who, he worked on where, while he was at Princeton, but it was published when he was in Brazil. And I would say that since that time, Bohm worked almost entirely dedicated to the foundations of quantum mechanics, particularly to the, on the interpretation of this theory. And that's why the subtitle of my book is uh, the, uh, the Quest, uh, uh, a life dedicated to understand the quantum world. Uh, I'm not going to give technical details about this interpretation, but I want to say that uh, this in new interpretation significantly departed from the standard theory in its conceptual and philosophical assumption, but still arrived at the same predictions, at least in the non relativistic domain. Uh, departure from the standard theory came as Bond assumed a realist, so what was the most important assumption, a realistic point of view about the meaning of quantum mechanics. And he was able to recover the determinism for quantum phenomena, which had been discarded by the standard interpretation. This standard interpretation is also known as Copenhagen interpretation, uh, which is due to uh, new use Bond. I would say that with this interpretation, Bohm opened the way for alternative interpretations of quantum mechanics and showed that quantum mechanics could be supplemented by additional variables. The legacy of Bohm in the uh, spectrum of new interpretations, it's a uh, huge. Uh, we, everybody likes to cite John Bell, who said, in 1952, I saw the impossible be done. John Bell was referring to, 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 to Bond's paper. But five years after Bond left the Princeton, uh, another promising uh, American physicist, a young American physicist, Hugh Everett, published a different alternative interpretation, what we call now many words interpretation. I, as a historian, I worked on, on this history, and Everett was heavily influenced by David Bond's work. He did not accept David Bond's work, but he was influenced by his Bond and suggested a different solution. Uh, but no doubt that influence on Bell is the most important because, as we know, uh, what we call now Bell theory and the series of experiments which are being performed even nowadays have led the physicists to accept entanglement. There is the quantum correlation among systems which are far away one from the other. This was accepted as a physical effect, and this new effect has become the physical effect on the basis of quantum information, this field which has blossomed since the early 1990s. Now, you know, Bond's proposal was poorly received at the time. Uh, but here I have a difference with Bezo Haile and with uh, Paul Howard and with uh, David Pitt. Uh, I, 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 I talked to Paul Howard that the, the, as Oppenheimer appeared in the, 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 in the film, I think it was not a, 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 a good solution because for somebody who see the movies thinks, okay, Bohm's ideas were not accepted due to uh, Oppenheim and that informal phrase, we must ignore him. So why I do not accept this? First, because we have scant documentary evidence of this uh, statement. It was said by one physicist in 1989 in a debate at the American Physical Society. And the truth is the, the, the book by David Pitt. Uh, I never found a second evidence of the same story. And on the opposite, I have different evidences about Princeton 
uh, duty uh, with bond. But the second and the most important reason is that if you put all the responsibility uh, of uh, the poor reception of bond's ideas on Oppenheim's shoulders, we are alleviating, we are uh, disconsidering the role of the conservative physics community at the time. And this conservative attitude was not a thing in the past. It is part of science. And I consider very important to discuss this. So what was this conservative attitude? First, evidence. Bond was criticized not only by Americans. The most important criticism came from European physicists, like Heisenberg, Max Bohr, Niels Bohr, uh, Leon Rosenfeld. They were not influenced by uh, uh, an order uh, from Oppenheim. So my conclusion is different. My conclusion is that research in foundations at the time, without new predictions, was then considered more philosophy than physics. Treating foundations as just philosophical issues uh, enhanced a professional bias in, the, bias in the physics community against the subject of interpretation uh, of uh, quantum mechanics. Furthermore, the common view among physicists in the 50s was that foundational issues in quantum mechanics had already been solved by the creators of the physical, this physical theory. So there were there were no unsolved questions that deserved the energy of physicists, particularly young talents. Uh, in a previous book, I, I suggested the name quantum dissidents just to have a label to describe a whole group of physicists who were able to bring foundations of quantum mechanics from the margins to the mainstream of physics. The list of these quantum, these quantum dissidents is large. Uh, it includes uh, John Bell, it includes Abner Shimoni, it includes uh, Lance Pé, uh, it includes Jean, uh, Philippe Vigier, but the most important quantum dissident was David Bond. Now, I conclude telling you how I decided to write this second biography. Basil Hiley may remember, I, I'm not sure if he, had, if he had such a good memory. 1998, he went to Sao Paulo to a symposium in honor of David Bond. It was the first time I met Basil Hiley in person. And at the canteen of the Institute, uh, we were together, I, Michel Paty, Osvaldo Pessoa, who was the organizer uh, of the meeting, uh, and Basil Haile. And uh, David Pitt's biography had just appeared. And we were talking that the scientific content of this biography was not very deep. And then Basil Haile told to ask me, why you don't write a second biography of David Bond? This was 1998. I balked. I did not accept the challenge uh, for a number of reasons. I had a different project uh, at that time, and I found, and still I find, it very difficult to write biographies. Then, 15 years later, 17 years later, when I published The Quantum Dissidents, I was approached by Angela Lahi, who was who is the editor uh, of physics books uh, in, uh, at Springer, and she asked me, I'm preparing a new series of scientific biographies. Why don't you choose one of these quantum dissidents to write a biography of them? Then I took the decision. I said, okay, I want to write a biography of David Bond, but it has already one biography. Do you accept this uh, suggestion? And she accepted. That's why I decided in the end of 2015 to write this biography, which came out uh, in the last year. Now, I have a suggestion to question, to uh, have a, a question to, 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 this, to the following discussion. Uh, is that what connections, if any, we may find between uh, this portrait of the young David Bond and the later Bond as we knew him, in the sense that everybody in the room, uh, 
knows uh, David Bohm, has a certain idea of David Bohm. Uh, and I'm sure that the content of David Bohm I presented here is very different. The physics is a little bit different. Uh, politics is a very different. Uh, but what kind of connections or continuity uh, we may find or not between these two stages in Bond's life? Thank you very much. Oh, uh, thank you so much, Olival, for your presentation and for sharing uh, your work with us. Um, as yes, as Olival uh, mentioned, we will now break into these uh, small groups where we can discuss the question asked by Olival. Um, we have seen now sort of an exploration of Bohm's youth, his historical context, all the way from Princeton to Caltech to the Manhattan Project, etc., all the way into his um, arrival in Brazil. Um, so basically, the question asked is how does that connect to the bomb that we know? Um, you know, the, I guess the famous bomb, the, uh, the bomb that talks about wholeness, the, the bomb that talks about dialogue, and bomb with his later physics with the implicate order and explicate order. Um, so yes, I mean, that's the question that um, Olival is asking you. How, where are these connections? And then afterwards, we can all come back and uh, share our thoughts. Enjoy. So we're we're going to break away for about 15 minutes. So I'm opening up the rooms now. And you just have to accept uh, the invitation to join your breakaway group. Enjoy. Fantastic. Well, uh, welcome back. Hope you uh, enjoyed your uh, small breakout rooms. Um, now this space is your opportunity to contribute, ask questions to Olival about his great presentation, or um, yeah, I'll uh, leave it to you. Uh, if anyone would like to take, uh, you know, speak, if, just raise your hand or use the um, raise your hand option on Zoom and uh, we'll let you take over. Oh, Basil, yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit battered and bruised, so, oh, am I, am I, 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 are you, am I getting through to you guys? Yes, you are, yeah, yes. I'm clear. Yeah. Behave, eh, Basil? Okay. Behave. Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I will try. <laughs> no, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Oval for that very, very interesting historical background to David Bohm. I didn't meet him until 1960 and the past, his past has always been an enigma to me because what I saw David Bohm as uh, politically was right of the British Labour Party. Now if you know the British Labour Party is pretty right anyway compared with the communist movement certainly in Europe. So I was always amazed at how people would come up to me and say, what is it like working with a Marxist physicist? Because I didn't see him as a Marxist physicist. So something rather dramatic had happened from the early days. And Oval is a historian and has actually been in to the details. I'm afraid my history is just oral history, if you like, looking at what unfolded in front of me. So all my comments uh, have been that, uh, um, that what I saw was not a Marxist physicist. I knew a friend of his called Jean-Pierre Vigier. Very nice, very uh, astute man. Now he was a Marxist and one, can, one didn't even have to talk to him for more than about 10 minutes before he realized he was a real Marxist. And Bohm and him used to actually argue about Marxism. And Bohm would always be presenting what I would call the view from the right. So, uh, Oval, that is where I got my conclusions from. Uh, but I was looking very much at the history uh, to see if you could unearth things. And I think you clarified things much more in my own mind. 
Okay, I think I'll stop there. I'd like to talk eventually about uh, uh, about Oppenheimer and so on, but I'll, I'll just make those comments and open it up to the rest. Chris, hey. you, you made a very interesting piece of information in our group about Lenin, uh, and your experience, Chris, Judy. So if you could. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just uh, mentioned, oh. can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can yeah, hear you. Okay, okay well, uh, yeah, I just mentioned that uh, I remember uh, David um, when I first went to the because I'm not exactly sure when, but he suggested to me once that uh, I should read uh, Lenin's book called Materialism and Imperial Criticism. Um, in order to gain more understanding of, you know, some of the, uh, the ideas that he was interested in. So I, I think that, um, and actually when, as I said in, in the group, if you look at his book, The Natural Philosophy of Cause and Chance, and uh, this, uh, the book of Lenin, then if you are reading those at the same time, you can see that there are, you know, strong influences from the... Um, materialism, materialism of, uh, of Marx and Engels and, and the basic sort of philosophical approach. I mean, Marx and Engels were, I think more Engels probably, were, um, had this notion of the qualitative infinity of nature, which of course, you know, translates uh, very clearly in, in some of Bohm's ideas. So I think he, I mean, it's clear that Bohm um, wasn't, he certainly wasn't a Marxist in the same way uh, as Jean-Pierre Vigier was. I think uh, uh, Vigier remained in the Communist Party and uh, <clears throat> he fought in uh, Vietnam but, uh, against the Americans. Um, he, he was a committed communist his whole life, and, but he was much more politically committed and uh, much more... Um, he, was, he was a great, great character. But, uh, uh, he definitely saw uh, physics as part of the battle for uh, the establishment of a uh, you know, socialist world. And, um, so they were definitely very different, as Basil said, uh, on that. But I think, you know, Bohm was someone who would uh, take ideas and uh, he wouldn't reject anything just because, oh, you know, that's Marx. We can't possibly read that because you know, um, that's been is played out in the world in, in unhelpful ways, perhaps one could say. Uh, certainly Bohm was someone who was interested in ideas and, and ways of thinking. And he would take, um, he would take, you know, the sensible parts uh, from anywhere. And uh, so, you know, I think there was uh, more, perhaps some continuity in his later life. He certainly rejected the, the, the political ideas, but the, the basic um, philosophy, I think, of materialism um, and those ideas of Engels remained, you know, part of his ideas, even though, of course, he wasn't a Marxist in the sense that he was a disciple or someone who believed in Marx, you know, and he would only um, propagate Marx. So, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, that's just what I have to say. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you, Basil. Yes. Uh, Oliver, would you like to uh, answer to that? Also, Eddie is asking a question. Oh, yes. Well. Yes. No, I just want to say, Alabal, yeah, that was such an interesting presentation. And I had never known that David was such a, a sort of a, an extrovert, in a sense, in his school days. He had, like, what you brought out was he had a leadership role. And what struck me was that by later on in his life, that's what's manifested. He became a leadership role. And now with Paul's documentary, it's almost celebrating that long after he's died. And his leadership role is now continuing, even though he's no longer alive. So I just thought that was a connection there, maybe. Uh, anyway. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Eddie. Um, would uh, anyone else? Would like to ask a question or make a contribution? Could I? Could I just ask a, a, a quick question? 
Um, my understanding is the film suggested that David Bohm had a, a capacity, a talent to get people to care for him or wanted people to care for him. And I guess my question to Oliver isn't, because I know very little about communism or not that much about politics, but isn't that an aspect of sort of idealistic communism in the sense that you're surrounded by people caring for each other? So I'm just wondering if an element of this could have not come from, from, his, from his early early life. Thank you. Um, the, there we go. Um, Oliver, would you like to respond to that? I, I can make a, a short comment. Uh, the last question by Alan. Uh, you are right. Uh, I would say that uh, this is the idea that uh, David Pitt called uh, Bohm needed a, a father a figure. Uh, either the Communist Party or uh, Oppenheim. Uh, I didn't follow this psych psychoanalytic uh, trend, but uh, it's clear that when Bonn joined the Communist Party, there were, as I said, uh, two uh, influential uh, reasons. Uh, the most general related to the world situation. And the second one, it was the team of people around Oppenheim. So it was not only Oppenheim. It was Oppenheim, it was Melba Phillips, it was Frank Oppenheim. These were uh, colleagues. I would say that at that time, Bon had the first team of people around him. He eventually became a very uh, uh, acquaintance, uh, 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 with uh, acquaintance. Some of it then followed him throughout his life. For instance, uh, Melba Phillips uh, kept uh, her correspondence with him throughout the, the, the 50s. Then I agree with you with this, uh, this idea. But I would say, <laughs> from my uh, perspective, this is, this is very natural. Much of the people who go to a political party who go to a religion uh, denomination, they are looking for a kind of a, a, a socialism experience. It's like a, a sub, sub, many times substitute for, for family, for instance. So uh, I totally agree. Uh, uh, second comment, uh, I think that uh, uh, only very recently I realized it better uh, this this thing that during uh, called our attention uh, because I, I always read this Marxist influence uh, in the later bone uh, through the realism but there was a second influence the second influence which came from uh, the Marxist background it's this idea of infinite levels indeed bon is one of the thinkers, uh, he did not write too much about this uh, later, but he, he was one of the, the thinkers uh, who did not accept this uh, strong reductionism in physics, that you have a, a theory of, of everything and then you just derive uh, the, the same physics for other levels. Uh, I, I, I think that unfortunately, uh, his attention were in, uh, elsewhere because he could have interacted, for instance, with people from condensed matter who pressed the physics community, community to break up uh, this strong idea of uh, reductionism uh, in physics. I, I totally agree uh, with you. That's all. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we see, yes, Martha. Uh, so I, I will get to all the questions. Yes, Martha, would you I want just, to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. I have a, just a very specific question that came from the film. Um, after um, Oppenheimer said um, that they should basically ignore him, there was a quote that came up that said that Einstein said something about fairy tales for children. So did he also kind of shun Bohm and ridicule his work? 
are you familiar with that? That segment of the, it was it was right when they did the quote that said um, if we can't uh, if we can't disprove him we should um, ignore him, and then it's had Albert Einstein saying something about fairy tales for children or so. Uh, Marta, I think you took a very uh, sensitive <laughs> word, uh, in our discussion because you know that the film, <laughs> the publicity uh, of the film it's presenting bomb as the uh, Einstein spiritual, uh, uh, Einstein's uh, uh, spiritual song uh, and the uh, Dalai Lama scientific guru. It's that, if I'm not wrong. But I think that uh, in the, uh, one, uh, I, I would say, uh, Paul, uh, yesterday I received a letter from Don Howard, who is a very important philosopher of physics uh, in the United States, he wrote to me, did, did you listen to this idea that he was a spiritual son of Einstein? Uh, this is a problem, etc. Then I, I had yesterday, in the, the last two days, a huge exchange letters with Don Howard uh, about this. So uh, congratulations, Paul, because you moved uh, are uh, pressing people to check the, 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 the book, check the annotations and they discuss. The problem is that uh, the relationship of Einstein to, to, to Bon is, is very complex. I have no doubt that Einstein played a, 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 a role as a, a, a political father, uh, so he, he, he cared of, of Bon. I may tell you that uh, he did not accept the bomb idea to go to Israel because he, 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 Einstein had the intuition that Bon would not stay in Israel, but Einstein uh, wrote the letters. Einstein wrote letters to support Bon in Israel and he wrote letters to the Brazilian president to support Bon in Brazil. So no doubt about uh, uh, the, this kind of political influence. But in which quantum mechanics is concerned, uh, Einstein did not identify himself with the suggestion of hidden variable interpretation. This is clear cut uh, because Einstein had a, a different approach. I would say that maybe Einstein's approach was more similar to what Bond did in the 60s and 70s uh, then what Bond did uh, in 1951-52. Then indeed uh, uh, Einstein uh, criticized Bond and tell me one story. He criticized Bond's model and published this, critic, this criticism in a volume in honor of Max Born. But he was so friendly to Bond that he sent the criticism to Bond Bon replied the criticism, and Bon was right, and Einstein was wrong in physical, in terms of physics. And then Einstein asked Max Born to put this paper by Bon uh, uh, together with the paper by Einstein. So if you look for this book in 1953, you have Einstein's paper and Bon's papers. They are colliding. Uh, uh, one uh, against the other. And the, we have a, a, a second uh, uh, statement. Uh, Einstein wrote to Max Born and he, he said, what Born did is too cheap. Uh, so uh, Einstein didn't have in high esteem the hidden variable uh, approach, but high, Einstein had, had in high esteem uh, the kind of physics and the kind of, of philosophical role, etc., Bond was playing at that time. So it, it's not an easy, it's not clear cut to okay. say uh, uh, Bond was the spirit or song of Einstein, but I would say that a certain truth behind this statement is true, but it's not the, the whole truth. Thank you. It's all nuanced. Everything is nuances in life. Right. <laughs> Um, I see Dave Schramm uh, would like to ask a question. Oh, well, no, I'd like to continue the discussion a little bit about 
uh, Bohm being Einstein's spiritual son. No, I think the key word in this is spiritual, uh, that Bohm moved profoundly in the spirit of Einstein. Uh, they talked together, had many close conversations. And what Bohm was trying to do was open out a full, holistic, unified view of nature. And that was the spirit uh, of, wh um, of which I would think Einstein was speaking. Now, Bohm's hidden, hidden variable theory, I think we should be clear, this wasn't his uh, deep, profound, fundamentally thought out work that he uh, did with Basil on uh, pre-space and so on and on algebras, which only went so far, you know, before, before his death. But the hidden variable theory is just standard quantum mechanics. It's one of the standard versions of quantum mechanics, but people didn't want to accept it because it had causal behavior in it, which um, the great men of science said was not possible. But Bohm proved it was possible, and so they were upset. And therefore, uh, Oppenheimer called him a juvenile deviationist. He deviated from the high authorities of science who had said what could be done and what couldn't. So he did what couldn't be done. And so he was hoping that this would open out uh, exploration into science, um, into the foundations, into thinking into deeper principles. So what Ohm did with his hidden variable theory was just produce another form of quantum mechanics. Before that, there was Heisenberg's matrix mechanics and Schrodinger's wave mechanics. Uh, and uh, then uh, Feynman's path integrals. And Bohm did a fourth view of standard quantum theory. But this view, uh, the beauty of it is that it expresses things in such a way, it gives you a different perspective, it expresses things in such a way that you can see what's happening on the inside. And that you can see that there is a universal field or potential which controls all these things, which is non-local. So this is not something new. This is something which is in the old stuff, but Bohm found a way to reveal it. Now, so, but that's that little corner. But the deep Bohm had to do with his uh, wish to reformulate the whole of physics in an entirely different way, in a way that went beyond space and time and our understanding of what matter is. And Basil worked on him with that. Now, if you look at standard quantum mechanics, that was developed by many men over decades. And here are Bohm and Basil sort of alone in the, maybe with a few others, you see. So what Bohm uh, initiated in spirit uh, and followed through from Einstein in spirit is something that hasn't really come to fruition yet. And so I think it's if you take the word spiritual very seriously, as in moving deeply in the spirit of Einstein, in the kind of exploration he did, and actually in the way he used his mind, which is a whole other story, which is kind of embodied intelligence rather than just rational thought. Um, I think you'll find that it's deeply true that Bohm was a spiritual son of Einstein. And Einstein did criticize Bohm's hidden variable theory in the sense um, he said it was too cheap. Well, it was just the standard quantum mechanics. The standard quantum mechanics couldn't do this profound thing that they were trying to do to bring out this incredible unification. But Bohm just wanted to disturb controversy. He didn't, this wasn't the final solution, you see. So yes, it, it, the hidden variable theory was too cheap. But what Bohm studied, uh, gave his heart and mind to, and worked with, worked on, uh, and in particular with Basil, was something much, much more profound than this. It just hasn't come to fruition. So that's, that's, that's a personal view. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dave. I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Um, Would anyone want to ask? Uh, oh, yes, Laura. 
Good leave Laura. No, we're yes. here with the three of us, so it's confusing. Ah. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of curious because I like um, th thank you, Oliver, for your very interesting uh, uh, talk and also placing it in the context of the time um, that that uh, David Bohm was living. And something that really puzzled me as as we study this gentleman uh, in history is uh, what they actually stood for. Because of course we we talked a lot about the relationship with Oppenheimer and. Uh, I'm a beginner in studying Bohm, but to me, like he also stood for something like a very controlled kind of worldview and uh, working on the atomic bomb. And maybe I'm, ah, I need to put some notes in it, but to me, what, what Bohm also seems to stand for is, is the unification of, of all of us and the, the knowledge in, in different kinds of entities and, and the sort of outsider perspective and not the the modern Western uh, worldview that could put atomic bombs on, on, on people, but also the, 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 the way that we're all connected and that, that we're uh, taking care of outcasts and sort of the solidarity that we all have. Uh, is, is there some, and that, that seems to be super imposed, like they, and he did hit a nerve there because it, like all these, these uh, scientists, they, they, they did everything they could to belittle him, to call him uh, call him names, ignore him, and that's what we always used to do with my baby brother when he was really, really annoying. Uh, but so they, he did hit something there. But I'm, I'm kind of curious what what people think about what what these gentlemen actually stood for instead of like the the theories that they have, but like the the, the background of it. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Laura, for that question. Uh, is anyone? Brave enough to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Dave Schraben can answer that. Oh, uh, just unmute you. He's still uh, muted. There we go. Uh, well, I'm a bit on the spot here. What about Caroline? No. <laughs> 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 um, um, uh, because I was thinking of two things at once. I had one ear on the screen and the other ear on what was going on in my head. So, <laughs> uh, would you refer? Other one, maybe Basil wants to answer it. Would Would you rephrase it briefly? I uh, the um, I mean, I, no, I yeah, go ahead, Laura. Yes, sorry, I can make it easier. So, uh, to me. It seems that what David Bohm stood for was deeply, deeply confronting and dangerous for the, the, the orthodox um, kind of knowledge that was there. And I think it seems um, like the, the, the things he stood for were, were so dangerous for quite a lot of people. And I'm kind of curious uh, if there's more, yeah, what he stood for in a political sense or if, if what he said was true. Maybe does that mean we can't be throwing atom bombs on everybody, or is there is there like a are there relationships there with what these opponents would stand for instead of yeah sort of confronting each other on like a intellectual level or something? Can well, I come in? I you, think David, are you going? Oh well, just briefly then. Um, uh, in terms of throwing atom bombs on each other and so on, you see. I think at the root of so much of what David Bohm did was his concern for humanity. And so uh, he saw science as a sort of salvation in that way at first, but then he realized it wouldn't be. And uh, so in his later life, um, while he continued with science, he focused more uh, on um, the issues confronting humanity and he came to the conclusion that what was needed was a transformation of human consciousness, not just some new ideas. New ideas had their place, but something that went beyond that to uh, a different functioning of the mind, which has to do with what we might call embodied intelligence, something that he and Einstein both used. Einstein talked a bit about it. He didn't use those terms. And so Bohm felt that there was this uh, kind of consciousness which we all have subliminally, he called it participatory consciousness, which was uh, key to uh, humanity coming together. And he used it in his research to 
intuit things, move deeply into them as did Einstein. And uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but David's, David Bohm had this, yes, deep concern for the, uh, really the, the, the transformation of humanity, uh, the individual and the culture as a whole. And one of the ways he thought that might help this was a form of um, getting together in groups that it was yes. called dialogue. Yes. Mm. So Basil, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I, long time for a short. Thank you, David. Yes, Basil, would you like to uh, say yeah. something? I'll just say something from the point of view of the physics community, because I am still working with the physics community. And I think it, it's very difficult now to understand the hostility that there was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, because I, I, and one of the problems is that the physics community demand, I think Oval put his finger on this, physics community de demand a high level of mathematical explanations, if I can use those two words without contradicting each other. <laughs> and if you only use the metaphor, then I'm afraid you won't get very far with physicists. You have to actually do the hard work and do the mathematics. Now, David didn't like doing the mathematics. So I think there's a new book coming out where he actually criticized me because I was always trying to do the mathematics. And I don't know the exact words was, but something like, oh, Hailey is in the old tradition. He's only trying to do the mathematics. And I, I think that's a bit unfair because the idea should be to take the ideas, the basic structure behind it and produce the mathematics so that you can show the. I'm talking now about the physics community and show the physics community that this is not just what they call waffle, but is actually grounded in some deep mathematics. Now, the problem with that is <coughs> mathematics is hard work. And a lot of people who make a lot of stories about David Bohm have not done the hard work. If they'd done the hard work, they would realize that David wasn't that far away from what physicists were thinking anyway. For example, I was absolutely staggered to find that in Dirac's Principles of Quantum Theory, which is the Bible that physics students learn about when they most of them learn about that in my time i don't know about now because things have changed but in my time that was taken as the standard text and in that book is essentially the beginnings of bones hidden variable theory but einstein uh, sorry dirac was doing a power series expansion in terms of planck's constant now planck's constant is very small a macroscopic world. So any power of Planck's constant squared and above can be neglected. And what um, Dirac showed was that you can get one of the equations that Oval put on, the, I think you would say the second equation, but when he went to the third equation, he was frightened because all he could get was the classical result, but he was frightened to I'm putting frightened in quotes, please, of taking the H squared terms, Planck constant terms, because those terms he thought would lead you to a contradiction with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. What David showed was it doesn't. But to, that doesn't mean to say the Heisenberg principle is wrong. It's still there but you can handle it in a different way. And that's what was lying, well, that was the real message behind the hidden variable approach. So I hope that sort of helps to understand why Ohm's ideas on just the hidden variable type of, of approach was taken up because it is very simple. But the great thing that Chris Dutney did was to show how you can bring it alive and give you some real 
insights into what could be going on. But the physicists, I, I don't think, have fully appreciated that point even today, although it's changing. Well, um, thank you so much, Basil, for uh, adding to the uh, discussion. Uh, unfortunately, I do need to uh, close this session. We're already in overtime. Um, Oliver, would you like to just uh, say something to close the session? Uh, just to thank uh, everybody for the wonderful discussion we had here. And if I have just one sentence, I would say that uh, Bon Libre uh, in different moments, in very specific and influential moments of the 20th century. So I don't think that it's reasonable to try to, to collapse uh, uh, everything in Bon's life and uh, to find a consistent uh, attitude. So for instance, uh, the rejection of the physics community of the hidden variables in the early 50s, for me, it's completely unrelated to the production of atomic bomb. The production of atomic bomb, I would say that all physicists who could contribute to the atomic bomb in the early 40s, they did this because they thought that if the US did not have the bomb, Hitler would have the bomb. That's why Einstein, who was always a uh, uh, supporter of, 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 uh, 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 against the war, he wrote a letter to Roosevelt, to Roosevelt uh, asking for a speed up uh, the, 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 the atomic project. Now, the rejection, I totally agree with Basil Hyde that it's difficult to understand how the physicists in the 50s uh, rejected uh, David Bohm's ideas on quantum mechanics. Uh, I have just a sociological uh, explanation, uh, and the sociological explanation is not very beautiful. It's that scientific communities may be very conservative, may be very dogmatic. And I think that in the 50s, they were dogmatic, they were conservative towards Bond's ideas. That's the reason through the time Bond's role was recovered when all the research on foundations of quantum mechanics and in the 90s, all the field of quantum information brought bon result to the forefront of physics. But I think that if you, we can play a role to, to tell the physicists, please don't be so hard with new theories because many times these new theories may open new fields of, of research. I think that it, for me, it's the moral uh, lesson from Bond's uh, episode in the early 50s. Thank you very much again. Oh, thank you so much, Oliver. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for being part of our series. And thank you all for joining us and contributing. It's been really fantastic. Now, before we go, I do want to make just a couple announcements. I'll try to make it quick just because we're late. Um, well, first of all, I would like to invite you all to tomorrow's session uh, with mathematician Chris Studney, who's here with us. Um, Chris, tomorrow we'll talk on um, quantum trajectories and the nature of wholeness in David Bohm's quantum theory. Uh, the event will be at the same time as today. Uh, we'll start at six o'clock uh, central time, uh, but of course we'll start a bit earlier just so we can get to know each other first. Um, to, I'm just going to send the uh, link to the uh, information on our website about the talk in the uh, chat section. Another announcement that I would like to make is that after so much enthusiasm and request, we have had permission from the director, Paul Howard, to show the movie again. Um, by tomorrow, you should receive a YouTube link, uh, which is the which will have the recording of the live screening that we had on the 11th of July. Uh, now, this is a private link, so available only to you guys, the uh, participants of the summer series, and will only be available for 48 hours. Um, I do ask to please not share this link, as it's uh, you know it's sort of a a gift to you guys to. Uh, have the opportunity to see the movie again. Um, if you have any questions of 
any nature, uh, you can contact us, uh, me and Eleanor, via the website or the email. Um, I'll just put our email addresses in the chat section. Um, and again, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you again soon here at the Party Centre. Thank you everybody. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you, all. Bye. Oliver, thank you so much. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you, James. Thank you, Paul. Ciao a tutti. Bye -bye. Ciao, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see you thank tomorrow. You. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Take care, everybody. Auf Wiedersehen. Danke. Arrivederci. <laughs> was wonderful. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you bye for bye. joining us. Bye-bye. <laughs>